following is a presentation of Project Independence and WCWP. Project Independence is the Aging in Place initiative of the Town of North Hempstead. We provide programs and services designed to assist and support the older town residents who wish to remain in their homes as they age. If we don't currently provide a service, we will try and connect you to that service. Call 311 or 869-6311 to get more information or receive services. Welcome to Project Independence and you. Welcome to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. I'm your host, John Ryan, and my co-host today is Otto Los. Good morning, uh, John. It's been a while since we've been back and forth. The last like month or so, Otto was away, I was away, uh, Christina was away, um, Rebecca's been in and out, so uh, it's nice for the three of us to get together, and of course with Dan. Um, and today we have a wonderful, wonderful show. Uh, today we have Gina Tudor with us, uh, and Gina is Jenna. I'm sorry, not yes. Gina. Jenna, I apologize. I asked you earlier, and <laughs> went in one ear and out the other. Jenna, and Jenna is the office manager of the North Hempstead Animal Shelter, and this is truly an amazing organization. Um, later on, Jenna is going to show us two of her pets, but <laughs> what we're going to be doing today is basically asking Jenna how the entire situation works, how you can get a pet, but we all have to be cognizant. You just don't take a pet and bring it home. There's a lot of work before it and a lot of responsibility. I mean, especially for a senior, you can't get like, I don't think, a six month puppy because you won't be able to keep up with it. So there's lots of questions we're gonna be asking Jenna this morning. And Jenna, first of all, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time Oh, yeah, of course. I'm glad to be here. How did you wind up working? Let's start off that way with the shelter. So uh, believe it or not, I have my degrees from school are actually in wildlife ecology. And I was in graduate school at Stony Brook. And I came across this position and it, I started out part time in 2010. So it was while I was in grad school. But, um, you know, I just loved the job and I stayed on and eventually I was offered full time in 2013 after I finished my graduate program, but I decided to stay on. So I've been there. Yeah, 11 years now. We always talk about this, Jenna. Yeah. <laughs> own their job. It's so important. It wasn't like, guess what? They gave you an extra thousand dollars. So you stayed. <laughs> you're right. there because you want to be there which is the Ab most important. yeah absolutely I you know some days are tough at the shelter but overall it's a really a, an awesome place to work could I ask you a question there's uh I you know read some stuff and uh as I understand it the time the town of North Hempstead provides the shelter and then the an organization called the shelter connection provides the volunteers Yes. So the town, uh, the town animal shelter, North Hempstead Animal Shelter, that's funded by taxpayers. But we do have a volunteer organization called the Shelter Connection that is contracted with the shelter and they do very important things. First of all, that's where our volunteers come from. And they also do things like raising money for shelter improvements. Uh, a few years ago, they actually did turf in our yard. So it's like the dogs have grass under their feet. Um, they provide uh, better food for us. They supplement our food bill so we can feed high quality food. And they also, probably the most important thing they do is they uh, subsidize a lot of medical treatments for the dogs that the town wouldn't be able to cover. So we can kind of go above and beyond with treating medical ailments on dogs that come in. In, in reference to medical treatments for the animals there, mm -hmm. if I go today and I'm going to adopt a pet, and yes. I pick them out or her out, whatever, do you give the shots and follow up with it or I go then to my own private vet? How no, uh, yes, every, every dog that's adopted from us comes up to date with all vaccinations, spayed and neutered, a microchip with free lifetime registration, licensed with the town of North Hempstead, and we give you a brand new leash and collar. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Do you also, excuse me, do you also have some sort of a, 
uh, it's not a training program, but some sort of an acclimation program where, you know, you would be sitting with the senior. I'm going to be talking to seniors, but we could, you know, mm -hmm. other people could get it too. But you would be sitting and say, you know what? I think this particular pet is a little too aggressive for you. Or I think this one is a oh, little yeah, too- Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, every, every, you know, adoption that we facilitate, we spend a lot of time with, you know, the um, visitor that comes in that's interested in adopting. We spend a long time with the dog, um, you know, getting to know the person before it goes home. And we absolutely will say, you know, if we don't feel like it's comfortable, you know, that it's going to be a good match and not everybody's comfortable, um, you know, we're not going to set a dog up to fail, you know, in a home. So we will absolutely, um, you know, do our best to match the energy and temperament level of the dogs that we have in the back with who is coming. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, a high energy puppy might not be the best uh, for, a, you know, for a senior to take home because they do have a lot of energy. It's a lot of work. You have to take them out several times a night, you know, during the day. It's a lot of work. Absolutely. How, how Especially in the dogs, transit. Head out of, I'm sorry. I'm, no, I'm sorry. How many dogs are in the shelter? Like what's capacity, if you will? Um, right now we have... Uh, we've actually had a lot of adoptions over COVID and quarantine, like most shelters on, you know, in the country. I guess everybody feels like they have the extra time, which is great. So they've been, you know, there's been a surge in adopting. Um, so we don't have as many as we usually do. We have about 25 dogs right now, which definitely isn't as much as we as we usually do. We have the capacity to hold up to about 70 if we absolutely needed to. Hmm. How long typically is a dog in the shelter? A lot depends on its adoptability level. If it's a younger dog that gets along with everybody, gets along with dogs, kids, etc., may you know maybe we have it ten days. I mean, every dog that comes into the shelter, we hold for ten days just to get a feel for its personality and what type of home would be best, um, and also so it could see a vet and get spayed or neutered if it needs to be. Um, so those dogs, they kind of go right out as soon as they're available for adoption. But sometimes we have dogs that, you know, might be a little fearful of certain people or might not like other dogs. And those ones will sometimes stay for a while. I mean, we have a couple dogs that have been with us for a few years wow. at the shelter. So yeah. You mentioned the word adoptability. Yeah. Do you reject a dog if you don't think it's going to be an adoptable dog? No, because we're, because we're the town, we don't have, uh, we can't pick and choose what comes into our shelter. So the way the dogs come in are strays. We're responsible for picking up all strays in the town, um, in, in the town limits, um, even in the villages, et cetera. Um, if you find, you know, if you find a dog, the first place you should call is the animal shelter because usually people are calling us uh, with reports if they are missing their dogs as well. So it has the biggest chance of being reunited with its owner if you know the dog ends up with us. Um, so we can't choose that obviously. And we also take in surrenders. So any residents of the town, um, as long as you have proof of, residence, uh, proof of residency, um, if you have to give up your dog for whatever reason, we take it for a $50 surrender fee. It's, you know, and we absolutely, as long as we have room, we're going to take it. How, like, uh, let's say I'm going through the process and you've talked to me as in a potential adopter of a dog. Mm -hmm. What would I now go in there and based on like a match, I guess, um, uh, you would then say, okay, these three or four dogs we think would be good for you? Or do you say, we think this dog would be good for you? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, it depends if we have, you know, if we if we happen to have four that we think would be a good match. I mean, we'd gladly show you all four if you wanted to see, and then you could choose. Um, the way we're operating right now, though, is we are doing everything by appointment only. So we aren't having people come in and look through our kennels the way we used to. So we are asking people to either look on our website um, 
or give us a call first. And then we would discuss the potential options of what we have that would be a good match before coming down. And then we would make you an appointment. And if there is more than one dog, you know, that would, you know, that we think would be a good match, we'd be happy to show you, you know, what we, what we have. Yeah, well, off the top of your head, Jenna, and this is yeah. one of those like cutesy questions. What is the most adoptable trait? Like, you know, there's so many things that go into it. I mean, uh, you know, if the, if the puppy is too young, if it's too old, yada, yada, yada. But when, when a, a, a potential client comes in, what do yeah. you find is the one thing is like, oh, they're going after that one. <laughs> um, usually, if the, usually if the dogs are good, are very happy-go-lucky and good with kids, you know? Um, that's usually, we get a lot of families that come in and even if they don't have kids, um, themselves, you know, they want to be able to bring their dogs out to parks and the dog parks and stuff like that. So as long as the, you know, usually any dog that's just happy, go lucky, doesn't even matter the age. Usually we do very well with adopting older dogs at the shelter too. As long as they get along with other dogs and kids, they are usually adopted very quickly. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, you mentioned that uh, the, the town picks up strays. Yes. Uh, to me, that sounds like a difficult job. Uh, you know, at one point in my life, I, I, I went to Brooklyn quite often mm -hmm. and there would be packs of strays in Brooklyn. And that was a very uncomfortable feeling to oh, be wow. honest about it. You don't have that here that I'm aware of, but no. um, you know, a stray, how did, you know, you, you Dogs can't talk, obviously, so mm -hmm. you don't know how the stray got there. Right. And you, you don't really know what's going on with that stray. So I would find that to be a challenging job, to be the one who picks up the stray yes, dogs. I have to say that's not my job. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm in the office uh, most days. Um, we do have dog control officers, and that is their main job, and they are absolutely trained how to, you know, how to approach dogs the best way, the safest way to approach a dog um, to make sure that they don't get bit. Very, in, in some cases, very scared dogs that are not coming to, um, that are not coming to us easily. We can, we actually have like a large dog trap and we just get the permission of the property owner and we can actually set like a, a humane trap to catch the, you know, to catch the dog. If it's absolutely petrified, not coming to us at all. Um, so we do have to do that sometimes, but for the most part, the strays are really, they're happy family pets that just happen to, someone happens to leave the gate open. You know, a contractor comes in, accidentally leaves the door open and the dog gets out. So for the most part, you know, we've been pretty lucky with, um, you know, we pick up for the most part, nice dogs at the shelter. Um, we do in, the best thing for your dog though, to make sure it's reunited is to one, have a collar on it. I'm very surprised at how many people don't keep collars on their dogs and also microchipping. Um, if the first thing when a stray comes into the shelter is we check for a chip. Actually, what we're going to have to do, we're going to take a break because I want to know more about microchipping. Mi sure. Micro chipping, excuse me. <laughs> You're listening to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. We'll be right back. So I get this call from my grandma and she's like, What's a podcast and how much does it cost? So I tell her, podcasts are like radio shows, but you can download them on any device and listen to them anywhere at any time and they're free. And then she says, I see, but where can you find good ones? And I'm like, go to WCWP.org slash podcast and check out the lineup of original shows or download any podcast app on your phone or tablet and search for LIU Studios. And she's all like, oh, that sounds easy. And then she asked me what an app is. LIU Studios Podcasts, available on any podcast app. You know, those little button things on your phone screen. Just ask your grandkids. Welcome back to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. I'm your host, John Ryan, and my co-host today is Otto Lowe's. And we're having a wonderful conversation with Jenna Tudor, who is the office manager for the North Hempstead Animal Shelter. And this is not just any shelter. The stuff that's going on there is tremendous. And just before we went into the break, Otto had a question. So I'm going to send it to Otto and we'll continue on with Otto and Jenna. Well, you've got to remember your microchip question too. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> um, yeah, what I'm thinking is like, 
I'm a dog and I've started to really like it at the shelter. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's a nice place. It's like I'm in a dog resort and <laughs> maybe I don't want to I leave. Mean, I don't know if I go so far to say it's a resort, but we do take pride in creating a very comfortable and healthy lifestyle for the dogs at the shelter. Uh, we do have some dogs, as I said, we have about probably 10 or 11 dogs that have been with the shelter for been at the shelter for more than a year or so. And I have to say they're they're very comfortable, you know, between our volunteers and the staff, they get out of their kennels, um, you know, at, at, usually every day. They, we have a beautiful nature trail that's completely fenced in, thanks to the shelter connection for um, paying for that, as well as our play yard that's equipped with agility equipment. So they get to, most of our dogs know how to do the agility course. They get to go on the nature trail. Uh, we have a vet tech on staff, but we have a uh, working relationship with Port Washington Animal Hospital. So any, you know, ailment that the dogs have, we immediately treat. Um, and it obviously it's a complete dog loving staff at the shelter. So yes, there are we're, we're proud that the dogs are so happy at the shelter, but would it be best for them to be in a home? Absolutely. You know, that's always our ultimate goal is to get them into, you know, get them into suitable homes. We're going to bounce around a bit. Yeah. One thing that I'd like to touch on, which I don't really understand at all, is microchipping. Like, <laughs> okay. Where does yeah. it go, the purpose, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. So a lot of people think that a microchip works kind of like a GPS, but that's not exact. That's not how it works. Uh, a microchip is a small piece of electronic equipment. It's about the size of a grain of rice and it's inserted under the skin, usually between the shoulder blades. And each chip has a unique number on it. The only way that chip works is if it's registered. You have to call the company that issued the microchip to register your information to it. If not, it's useless. So what would happen is, if a dog came into the shelter as a stray, the first thing we do is we scan it for a microchip. So there's a little scanner device. We hover it over the dog and it can pick up the number. So then once we have that number, we can call the company that issued the microchip where it's registered with and retrieve the owner's information and let them know that we have the dog. When somebody gets a dog through the shelter, does that dog have a microchip yes. in it? So not only does the dog, when you adopt from North Hempstead Animal Shelter, not only does the dog come with a microchip, we actually provide free lifetime registration. We register the chip for you. Okay. Now, yeah. a question is like, suppose all of a sudden I find I can't really handle a dog. <laughs> I mm -hmm. don't like to use the words return policy, but I guess no. that is the question. Like COVID is over now. And I've read that because of it, that there are some dogs that are returned uh, because all of a sudden people are going to work and uh, they don't have the same freedom that they had before. Yes. Um, so any dog adopted from us, lifetime, you can return the dog if it's not working out. In fact, it's in our contracts that you can't rehome the dog yourself. After any length of time, you would have to bring the dog back to us for a $25 return adoption fee. Um, it could be, you know, seven days later, seven weeks later, seven years later, you have to bring the dog back to us. Um, we have been very lucky that we haven't had return adoptions of dogs that we have adopted out because throughout this whole process, we've remained very cautious with where we, um, you know, adopt our dogs to, but we have been getting some surrenders in from either dogs adopted from other shelters or bought from puppy stores, you know, during COVID. So we have been getting um, in recent weeks, a little bit of an influx of surrenders in, but they haven't been dogs that we have adopted, thankfully. It's been, you know, again, as I said, dogs from other shelters or puppy stores. Going, going through the process, and, and I have my concept, um, and if I'm looking to adopt a dog, mm -hmm. I'm going to assume it's a couple of days involved. I'm going to assume that I would be sitting in an area with the dog, and you would be coming in or somebody else giving me some instruction, 
as to how to, you know, be yeah. nice with people and vice versa and, you know. Yeah. Um, believe it or not with us, um, as long as the dog is available for adoption, um, it really is in a couple of days. We usually talk on the phone first. If we feel like it's a good match, we have you come down and meet the dog. Um, you can spend, you know, some people know in a minute, they know after spending 10 minutes, some people want to spend a half hour or 45 minutes before making the decision. Some people go home and call us the next morning after sleeping on it. Um, but yes, we spend one of our knowledgeable staff members will stay with you and the dog and answer any questions that you have. Um, advise you on some tips on, you know, once you get the dog home. And as long as the dog is available for adoption and has been spayed and neutered already, spayed or neutered, uh, the dog can really go home same day. Wow. It doesn't I, have to be a couple of days. Is there an age restriction in terms of being too young or too old to adopt a dog? Yes. Our policy at the shelter is, is, is if you're living on your own, um, like not with your parents, we require the age of 25 and up. If you're a little bit younger, but you're still living at, you're still living at home with your parents and it's a family decision, um, someone 21 or older can sign the paperwork to, you know, make themselves the owner of the dog. How about the reverse, like a hundred and down? <laughs> no. No. I, actually, that's a good question though, Otto, because is there a situation where somebody who wants a dog, maybe 75, 80, maybe requiring a walker to get around, maybe has macular degeneration, maybe has one of these things where you, Jenna, would turn around and say, you know what? You know, we are looking at a little six inch or one foot little puppy, you're gonna step on the thing. Um, uh, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, we we don't tend to have puppies at the shelter too often. So we usually don't have, um, you know, we don't usually have to have that conversation too much. Okay. But um, we usually, when a senior comes in to adopt and, and there does seem to be some physical limitations, we do, want to see if there's anyone that's going to be helping uh, that senior, if there's anyone else living in the home, um, because if they do have help, that that's a big, you know, that's a big factor in influencing our decision. If they're an experienced, you know, pet owner and they had a dog that just passed away, I mean, we're not going to, we're not going to deny them. We'll, we'll talk all, all about, you know, safety and things like that. And we're also it, it has to be a dog that's going to match their energy level and everything. So a nice older senior dog might be a great companion, you know? Right. I get you. Yeah. Another question, which I think is important. And we've had this conversation, Otto and Christina and mine, the finances, do you sit down to ensure, you know, all of a sudden you get the puppy home, not a puppy, it's a three-year-old, yeah. a seven-year-old, but now he breaks his leg. Yeah, it's, surgery. it's three or four thousand dollars. The senior right. doesn't have the money, but we should have known that in advance. Yeah, we always we always talk about, you know, finances before the dogs get adopted. I mean, it's in our contract that, you know, you're you assume financial responsibility of the dog from this point forward. Um, and you it is something that you absolutely have to be pre prepared for because whether you adopt a, a one-year-old or a you know 10-year-old dog yes the older dog you you can expect higher vet bills and stuff as as the dog gets older but you never know something can as you said the dog can break its leg or tear its acl or develop cancer young and it is something to consider you have to be prepared for that as a pet owner, because, you know, nobody's going to help you out with that, unfortunately, you know? So, so, yeah. Like I've had family members that I am aware of, daughter, several, who've all had bills that add up to like five, $6,000 just for the health part of it. But the, the, there's more to it than that. I think, you know, it's ongoing, even yeah. if they're not a sickly dog, there's an ongoing need to get them groomed or health or you have yeah. to feed them, you know, you have to buy food. You don't, you shouldn't, yeah. I don't think take the food right off the table and feed them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there really is a very heavy financial responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm assuming that there is no 
assistance for that type of thing? Um, there are some groups that do provide, um, you know, some, some private groups that do provide um, financial assistance for things like that. But there are some ways to make it cheaper. Um, for instance, you can get the dog's vaccinations through uh, clinics like Vetco, which is through, you know, the Petco stores. And also the town of North Hempstead twice a year hosts free rabies vaccination clinics. Uh, we didn't, we haven't done any because of uh, COVID, but we do expect to start again next year um, where you can actually bring the dog. We usually do one at the shelter and then one in Westbury. And you can bring the dog for, as long as you're a resident of the, of the town. Baby's vaccination from us uh, for, your, for your pet, dog or cat or ferret actually. Um, but there are, yeah, there absolutely are some groups. There's some pantries and stuff that will, um, you know, that eases the burden a little bit of finance, of finances. But, you know, that's kind of a pain. Um, so the best thing to do is just be prepared for the finances before you get the dog home. Is there any sort of follow? You know what? Um, I, this is a serious question. And I, and I really want to talk about it, but it makes more sense to go into the break first. So you're listening to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. We'll be right back with an important question for Jenna. WCWP is your home for great music and great conversation. You'll find all that and more on WCWP.org. Listen live on the web. Check out the lineup. Subscribe to podcasts and stay up to date on the latest station events. Get in touch with us and let us know if you like what you're hearing. And find out how you can support or get involved at the only community public radio station serving Nassau's North Shore. Plus, sign up to get a free bumper sticker. It's all online at WCWP.org. Welcome back to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. I'm your host, John Ryan, and my co-host today is Otto Lose. And we're having a wonderful conversation with Jenna Tudor, who is with the North Hempstead Animal Shelter. Um, my question, just before the break last time, um, and I, I think this is tremendous, and I think some seniors... It's like a lifeline. It really is. I mean, your, your, your children, your adult children might live in different states to come home at night and have something jump up and down and acknowledge your existence. Is oh. there some sort of, and I'm stretching the word support group, but ongoing group where I would call and say, you know, Jenna, I don't know what's going on. We had such a good time for the last two weeks and now Muffin is just sitting in the corner. Um, that type of thing. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, we always encourage anyone that adopts from us to call us with any questions, concerns. We would be able to put you in touch with the trainer that works with us who would, you know, will, she'll talk to you on the phone, no problem. Um, but yeah, so you could always, anybody that adopts, we always encourage them to call us if they have any, any questions. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's important because you don't want yeah. somebody to walk away and then feel they're isolated. And yeah, yeah. They're not getting along with the dog because, I mean, these dogs they, in a shelter, they might have been abused for six months. So just because they're coming into my house and I may be loving, it could take a month for them to adapt and not be afraid yeah. of me. And we're very honest about that. If we know any type, and, and, and we're very lucky, we really don't get a lot of, you know, abuse cases in North Hempstead. We really don't see a lot of that. The biggest reason why the why dogs come into the shelter, honestly, is because people are moving. That's usually the biggest reason is that they're moving and they are downsizing. They're going into a condo or a homeowners association that doesn't allow pets apartment. You know, that's that's the absolute biggest reason that we get dogs in. So that's um, that's a good one. what? That's a wonderful reason then. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's abuse we, or anything we, like that. We expect people to, you know, when if you adopt a dog from us, we expect you to keep it in your moving plans if you are planning on moving. But we're very lucky where we really don't see a lot of, you know, abuse cases like that every once in a while. But for the most part, not not really. I could, I could visualize a senior particularly uh, who's been going along real nice and able to go out and walk the dog and do all the nice things that you can do with a dog. And then all of a sudden, as John pointed out, 
uh, macular degeneration kicks in, or maybe they had a mini stroke or who knows what. What I'm hearing that's very good, I believe, is you're an alternate for, okay, I want to make sure my dog is taken care of. You are a place that they can comfortably bring the dog and be taken care of and hopefully get into another decent home. So it works yeah. both ways. In other words, you can um, move your dog along in life, if you yeah. will, or get a dog. Yeah. So we don't really want to in encourage that per se. Um, you know, one of the things um, that I actually did want to talk about is if a senior does come in to adopt a dog, we do like to discuss with the senior what's going to happen to the dog if something happens to you, because that's another big reason we get dogs in is either the um, in the worst case scenario, some, you know, someone passes away or they are moving into an assisted living or they no longer can physically care for the dog. So we do like to talk about that beforehand um, and see if there's anybody that would, because sometimes, you know, a, a, a son or daughter will also be in the conversation and offer to take the dog if something is going is, you know, happens to them, um, or a family friend, perhaps, because the older the dog comes to the shelter, the harder it is to get the dog adopted, you know, so we don't want to adopt out a five year old dog. Um, and then in, you know, five years, this senior can't take care of it anymore. And it's, you know, they're just like, Oh, we're just going to bring it back to the shelter because it's going to be very hard for that dog to get into a new home. I mean, most people, unfortunately, don't come into the shelter looking to adopt senior dogs. So, um, yes, we, we, you know, we are here as a resort, you know, not, not, I don't even want to say a last resort, but we're here as an option for that. But the best thing for the dog would be to go, you know, to a family member for the senior to have a plan before adopting the dog um, of what's going to happen if something happens to them. Uh, uh, my grandchildren's question list. I have one that we haven't hit yet. Sure. Um, <laughs> how do you handle anxious dogs? Meaning dogs that are uh, thunder, uh, fireworks, whatever. Um, there are some dogs that just can't handle that. Um, yeah. Any any ideas or suggestions? Luckily, the outdoor of our shelter is soundproofed, and wow. the inside, um, you don't the dog in the kennel area. You really don't hear all that much. The dogs don't hear all that much, but we do. We we have over the years had a couple that are very spooked, and we just try to put them in a really quiet room. We have a room up front when we know there's going to be, um, you know, thunderstorms and stuff, but nervous and anxious dogs, we really do our best to keep them as comfortable as possible. We have several rooms that are outside of the kennel that we utilize to kind of create a more homey um, experience for them. So uh, basically, no matter where the dog came from, but if it came from the shelter, mm -hmm. um, the dog may not have heard a whole lot of thunder <laughs> because it's soundproof. And all of a sudden the dog gets to your home and there's no more soundproof. Um, <laughs> and you wind up and I I've had it in, you know, again, family wise, that's why this is coming up um, where some dogs really, really have a real problem handling yeah. uh, fireworks, particularly, and then thunder comes along Um I guess I there's know. no real miracle to handle it. It's just something you got to ride out. There's varying degrees of, you know, my dog will, you know, luckily my dogs don't care too much with a lot of fireworks. One of mine will shake a little bit, but there are, there are, you know, vet medications and stuff and over the counter calming treats and stuff that you can use to kind of um, chill them out a little bit during that when you know something's going to be coming up. But unfortunately, that's probably one of the most common issues that people have with dogs. There's a lot of different advice on how to handle that, but I could go on forever about advice. And <laughs> I don't want to take up the whole segment talking about that. But um, yeah, unfortunately, there's not much you can do to fix that. <laughs> okay, well, that's an answer. Uh, yeah. And what it means is you have to contend with that as it sits 
you know, if right. you have a problem. Now, here's a question for you. You may never heard this one. <laughs> My granddaughter says, why do dogs' paws smell like Fritos? <laughs> nobody knows. <laughs> nobody, nobody knows. It's just the natural phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> That's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> And I, at least I asked the question. Now they're going to be listening to this. So you heard the answer, Jen. <laughs> Otherwise, Otto was going to get in trouble this weekend if he didn't ask the question. Good I, you, I know. I have to. If I ask, I have to answer. You know. <laughs> that's the. You got another one? Oh, no, go ahead. You're on. <laughs> I just wanted to jump in here because we, we at the break we started to talk uh, in reference to cats okay. and feral cats. And that situation in general, which I quasi understand, but I no, not that much either. Just go into the whole situation. I, I don't believe you take cats, but what do we do with cats? Okay, so yes, um, the town of North Hempstead does not handle cats. We do not take in surrendered, um, you know, cats that are pets. Um, we do not adopt cats out, but something that we do we do have a feral cat trap neuter release program. So I'm sure anyone that lives in North Hempstead or anywhere on the island really, you know, can look outside and you see, you know, cats walking around sometimes. Um, those are feral cats. They are not fit to be pets. They were born outside, lived their whole life outside. Um, they have no interest in coming in and being, a, you know, being a house pet. So what we do for them, because un unfortunately, feral cats, they do kill birds, um, which we don't want native wildlife, birds, stuff like that. Um, they can, you know, carry disease. So what we do um, to try and combat the population in a humane way is we have a free trap neuter release program. So what that means is a resident can call the town um, on the, you know, 311 line and ask to put in a feral cat uh, service request. At that point, our feral cat coordinator would call you back and she'd ask you if you wanted to trap yourself or if you wanted to uh, be on our trapper list where the trapper will come and trap the cats for you. It's just a little bit longer of a wait. We do a clinic once a month at the shelter. Um, so the people that opt to trap themselves they can borrow the traps for free from the shelter, set them up on their property. We go over how to humanely trap them, tips on how to successfully trap. And then you bring them to the shelter the morning of the clinic. We spay or neuter them. We give them a little bit of an ear tip while they're under anesthesia, um, which on the left ear, just so um, if the cat ends up in another trap, that person will know that this one has already been done. And we also give them vaccinations and treat them for, if they have fleas, we treat them for that. Um, and then they get released in the area that they were picked up in. You're not, you're not putting a chip in, are you? No, no, we don't do, we don't do chips because they really don't belong to anybody. So, you know, there's, there's not really a point in, in doing that. I okay. wish they had this program a long time ago. I had a situation quite a few years ago where uh, we had a problem with feral cats. Mm -hmm. um, they, they bring, they kill squirrels, they kill birds, they yeah. kill whatever they can get their hands on. And then they get, they got very comfortable and I would be grilling, uh, barbecuing. And all of a sudden there's like two, three of them, uh, very comfortable with the idea of jumping up on, on the piece on the side of the grill. Oh my God. <laughs> to the point, to wow. the point where uh, I, you know, I w it wasn't a comfortable feeling. And I actually, this is probably 30 years or so or more, wound up getting a trap. And there was, I didn't know about a program like this, but I would take them and, and drive them to uh, one of our daughters at that time was taking uh, riding lessons at a, one of the stables over in the North Shore. And I saw they had a lot of cats. So yeah. I basically took the trap over there and release the cats with all the other cats at the riding stable. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> we don't encourage it. No, I'm saying I'm not yeah, encouraging that either. I'm now. saying that didn't do anything because it didn't neuter them or, you know, mm -hmm. it just basically disposed of the problem for me and it put it somewhere else is what it comes down to. Yeah. And you're technically you not. You, this was all about barbecue. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. All about the barbecue. Yeah, you're not. This was at least 40 years ago, actually. I yeah. lived in Manhasset at the time. Yeah. Well, there are laws. You're not really supposed to be moving them because of rabies concerns. So they shouldn't be, you know, if you do have them on your property, we ask that you talk to us. But yeah, it's definitely illegal to trap them and just move them off your property um, on these days. Um, so, you know, again, because of rabies concerns, we, we you, you know, you can't do that anymore. Well, this, as I say, this was 40 yeah, years, no, I know, 40 but years just... ago. So I'm still free man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just for anyone listening that might have that idea now. <laughs> you know, the, the point is obviously with the feral cat situation, my my gut feeling is call 311. You have a question, you don't really know what to do. You have a few cats you think in the backyard wanting to come to your barbecue. You really don't <laughs> want to invite them. Call 311 and see what you have to do. Right now, we actually have to take another break. You're listening to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. We'll be right back with Jenna. Take WCWP with you wherever you go with the WCWP app. Listen live 24-7 to all of our streams, all from one app. Plus, call the studios directly from the app and visit our social media. Download the app through the iOS app store on Apple devices or the Google Play store on Android by searching WCWP Radio or visit WCWP.org for links. The WCWP app, available now on iOS and Android devices. Welcome back to Community Talk Radio here on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. I'm your host, John Ryan. My co-host today is Otto Los. And believe it or not, Jenna, this is the last segment already. It wow. You're right, that flew. <laughs> it really does. And Jenna is the office manager for the uh, North Hempstead Animal Shelter. And she is really just covering a multitude of all the stuff that goes on there. It's a phenomenal organization. And what I want to do before we go with another question is give Jenna credit for all that she does. Because uh -huh. this is... This is not just a job of dialing. This is a job of love because we're dealing with human beings on the senior side, on the adopting side. You're dealing with animals. So this is not, you know, building a table in the backyard. <laughs> it's really serious. We're trying to merge pets with, with people. And, and this is a lifestyle. And when they work. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, no, she's a matchmaker. <laughs> Coming on, this is tremendous. Go ahead, Otto. No, I said she's a matchmaker. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't think of that part of it. I had a question that uh, you may not know the answer to this, but I'll ask it. Um, we've had people on the show uh, previously talking about robotic pets. And oh. I could visualize, um, you know, like there are some situations where maybe uh, financially or physically or whatever, for whatever reason, uh, they can handle a live pet. Um, mm -hmm. Does that ever come up in any conversations? I can't say personally for me that it has. No, um, I I can't call me old fashioned, but I just can't see how something robotic would take the place of a, you know, warm, furry, live animal that would, uh, you know, that's fun to cuddle and, you know, there's just so many benefits, you know, of being in the presence of an animal. We're actually having somebody on in reference to that, Otto. So, I'm sorry, John, say that again. We're actually having somebody on in reference to robotic animals a month from now. Um, that, uh, and it really is, it's day and night between what Jen is dealing with, a touchy feely that's gonna sit on your lap and, and, you know, lick your face when you're feeling bad um yeah yeah pet you know pets absolutely with with seniors they you know combat loneliness um you know depression the increased activity level you know it has a multitude of benefits on heart health and cholesterol um but again you know, mobility is something to be considered. And so if you're not the most mobile person, a cat is a great option as well to have as a pet. Um, you know, cats can be just as loving as dogs. They sometimes get a bad reputation for that, but that's not true. They can be just as loving and they require a little bit less day-to-day, uh, -day, you know, care. 
actually, Jenny, I did say something there just very briefly, but I uh -huh. want to go back to, uh, and it statistically is proven, seniors who adopt pets definitively have reduction in blood pressure, reduction in cholesterol, um, so many different things. Now, I'm not talking about major life changes, but when you come home and you're alone, and maybe it was pouring rain, and it's right. a short day versus coming in and having a pet, whether it's a cat or a dog, jump up and down because they're happy to see you. Right. It provides, a, you know, it provides a sense of purpose and it provides, you know, a source of unconditional love. You know, a dog will never, that's the best thing about a dog or a cat. They never judge you. They're just there to love you. <laughs> You know, the other, I mean, physically, uh, if you have a dog and you're able, you walk. And mm -hmm. if you didn't have a dog, you might not walk. So exactly. that, could, that could contribute to the blood pressure and the cholesterol uh, as well as the mental part. Yep. Uh, one of the things that I read that I found very interesting is uh, when, you, when you have a dog, you specifically or a cat, uh, they don't think about tomorrow. They're, they're very much into now. And right. I think when you get older, uh, one of the things that's very important um, is to think about now, you know, thinking about tomorrow, 30 years from now, which is not going to be here, uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the need to think about now is reinforced because you have a dog or a cat, because that's how they work. They don't think about the future. They don't talk to you about uh, their social security or, you know, whatever else you might right. be concerned with. Of course. Mental, you know, mental help. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a very big part of it. There's no question about it. Um, and some of these things were never paid attention to years ago. And, <laughs> yeah. And now we do understand the benefits. You know, so in North Hempstead and, and other places around the country, it really behooves people to try to match up you know right. i i walk a lot and i walk uh north hempstead has a dog park now over at uh, clinton martin yes uh, clinton martin uh tully tully uh, yeah park. it's very nice yeah and it's nice and they have it broken down i think it's 30 pounds and under goes in one section there's very few people in that section frankly most of yeah. them are on the other section but what always gets me is i look and it's very much like a bunch of people to being together there's always the dog that's pushing every, uh, all the other dogs around. Oh, and, yeah. And, and the owner's standing there, frankly, not doing much about it. Uh, <laughs> I know. Th you know, that's, that's my, uh, my uh, feelings on dog parks, too. It's usually more of a social experience for the owners <laughs> than, the, uh, than the dogs sometimes. But, but it can be, you know, they can be really good. It's, you know, especially for seniors, to it's like kind of almost an excuse to get out there and socialize. And, you know, it's like a, a bridge for communication, starting conversations with new people. Um, I, I, you know, I can go on and on about the benefits. Well, yeah, but I think the owners are responsible. That's where we go back to the responsibility. Having a pet is a responsibility. Oh, and part of that is controlling. It's like if you have little kids and they're running around in the supermarket, ripping everything off the shelves, you're, <laughs> and you're supposed to, as a parent, control that. Uh, yeah. And as a dog owner, I think you're supposed to try to control the situation with your dog in a dog right. park. Uh, that's yeah, just I mean, an editorial that's comment on the, observation. Yeah, I mean, that's what we hope. You know, everybody hopes, but that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. So it's a risk you take when you go to a dog park with your dog. Right. So yeah. Actually, I know you have two dogs. Yes. That. <laughs> Should I grab one? Absolutely. Introduce us. Okay. <laughs> this is Hubble. Hubble's a pug mix. He was actually found as a stray um, in Westbury. A police officer called and said that they found this little guy and one of our officers came out and picked him up. He had no microchip or anything, no collar. I held my breath for 10 days because we do give the owner uh, 10 days to find, you know, to come forward for the dog. No one ever called about him. So he's mine now. How long, him, how, long? Huh? how long have you had him, Jenna? 
Uh, he came in in 2016, so five years already. Ah. Yes, five years. And then Miss Freya, oh, she might not show up on camera as well, but this is Freya. Freya was actually surrendered to the shelter pregnant in 2019. She had three beautiful little purebred pug puppies. And uh, we found homes for all those puppies. And then uh, my husband and I adopted adopted her. Wow, terrific. Yeah, they're so funny. They make us laugh every single day. <laughs> you know, this goes back to what I said earlier in the show. Jenna, yes. you are, you're living your job. Yes. <laughs> I mean, think about it, you have two of them with you at home. Um, I know, I know. Much? Well, how could you work at the shelter and not have your own dog, you know? It's so hard not to take them all home. I'm agreeing with you there, especially when, you know, you get yeah. so involved, you get so engrossed. And it really, as you said it earlier in the show, it's an act of love. Um, yeah. This is not just pushing paperwork. No. You know? This is connecting yeah. with people, connecting with animals, and just, it's a wonderful thing you're doing. Yeah, it's you know, definitely you, a job that comes home with you sometimes, you know, because as great as the job usually is on day to day, we do sometimes deal with not so great situations, you know, and as animal lovers, sometimes that sticks with you, you know, but. You, you said your husband and I, to <laughs> me, that's an important thing because if a family comes in and not the whole family's buying in on this idea. Oh, we won't let the dog go home. We yeah, require that could be that, a problem. Yeah. We require that everybody that lives in the house has to come down to meet the dog before going home. And everybody has to be on board or we will not allow that dog to go home. It has to be a family decision. Absolutely. I think that's important. Yes. Yeah. That's a tremendous point. Otto. I didn't even think of that, but you're right. One person wants the dog and the other two have no interest. Yeah. Not a yeah. good environment. Yeah. Um, one, one thing, if you don't mind, that I just wanted to mention before, because um, I know we only have a, a few minutes left. Um, I do also, the other part of my job at the shelter is running the humane education program, where I go into schools, I go into libraries and talk about the shelter. And, you know, a similar presentation to this, if it is with kids, I do have, you know, child friend friendly programs. I usually bring a dog, but I do go into senior centers. So anybody, you know, uh, I've, I've talked to civic associations and stuff like that before. So anyone listening that runs a group like that, that would be interested in having the, you know, shelter come down and do a presentation, I, you know, encourage to, to call because I love, you know, I love, as you can tell, I love talking about the shelter and uh, getting the word out, you know, about us and all the services we offer. Are there, is there a need for donations of any type, um, either financially, um, donating food, uh, donating you know, uh, I, I hate to say, or... yeah, I, we're very, very fortunate. Um, we have most of the stuff, you know, usually on a day to day, we have everything that we need. Um, we will take all sorts of food and treats. We don't usually use it at the shelter, but we work with several other rescues and pantries that we can stock and, um, don't, you know, we can, uh, get that food into a hungry dog's mouth. But um, probably the best form of donation is financial because that will go towards big shelter improvements. It will go towards medical bills. We have a, we have a, um, um, a fund called the Mendipaw Fund. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, that's one of the shelter connections most important thing that they do is they pay for like, for instance, right now, or we have in the past, we've had dogs that have come in with broken legs because they were hit by a car. And though that's thousands of dollars of bills that the town wouldn't be able to cover. So we draw from that Mendipaw fund from the shelter connection to pay for, um, to pay for those treatments. So to make sure that that fund is padded, um, is a, is a great thing. Is there, a, are there veterinarians that are actually employed by the town? Uh, not employed by the town, but contracted with the town. We do have a vet tech that's through the town on staff. She's there five days a week, but we are contracted with, uh, Port Washington Animal Hospital nearby. 
terrific. Jenna, yeah. we're out of time. This, oh. this was wonderful. It really was. The hour flew by. The information yes. you shared was just so wonderful. And you shared it lovingly and compassionately. And honestly, this was just, you're doing a great job there for the town and for all the people who are adopting dogs. Thanks. You've been listening to Jenna Tudor from the North Shore Animal League, Animal Shelter, excuse me, uh, on Community Talk Radio on 88.1 FM and WCWP.org.